Okay, then. So, density theorem. Last theorem of the course. Um, and you already know what it says. You have known what it says for a long time. If you have two CE sets, right, it only goes for CE sets. If you have two CE sets strictly ordered like this, then there is a CE set in between. Then, just the set A, which is CE, C30, reduces to A, reduces to C, and, and all orders are strict. Without strict, we should be able to do it correctly. <laughs> so this is going to be the, the, the strategy, or the, the, the theorem, and, and you kind of know what the strategy should be, uh, just because of our declares in the book, infinite energy, how, how did we do infinite energy, well it was all about the thickness lemma, and, and, and so the, the strategy, or the initial part of the strategy is, come up with the right set B, such that if we then apply thickness to this B and C, we get a set A, and this set A does the job. Okay, so in particular, you, you notice me slightly neglecting D, uh, but uh, I can just quickly take care of, of a lot of the stuff related to D by saying, okay, my, the first column of B is going to be equal to D, with, a, right, this, this kind of, with the right kind of encoding, it's not really equal to D, there's, there's, anyway, and, and so if I do this and then I take a set which is thick in B, then certainly it'll be to D. Okay. Um, one, uh, uh, one down, more to go. Okay, we also want, right, this inequality needs to be strict, so we want to make sure that A does not Turing reduce to D. But now we know some machinery for this, in particular, if I give you requirements QE, which say that phi E D is not equal to A, then, then clearly if I satisfy all requirements Q E, then uh, D does not compute A. And, and, and when you see this requirement, you have all sorts of immediate reactions to this. Um, because we, we, we know things about taking care of these kind of requirements. Uh, unfortunately, they, they don't quite work. Um, because, um, uh, well, to a large extent, D is right? D is given by the enemy. We have no control over D. So, in particular, <coughs> doing an actual length of agreement argument can't work, because in a length of agreement, you say, okay, look at the length of agreement. Uh, now preserve D, where it was involved in all of these computations, and you can preserve D because D is it's the enemy. Um, uh, but interestingly enough, still the right thing to do is just to uh, present nothing's going on and, and, and um, well, I'm not even going to write it out, right? Define the, the, the length of agreement between this thing computed from D and, and the set A. Uh, except that clearly the usual length of agreement strategy can't apply because we, we, we don't have don't have D. So now, what is uh, the trick? Well, the trick is, of course, he, here I, I'm talking about these requirements. These are the ones I want to satisfy. These are ones I have to satisfy for, for the set A. Well, this set A is supposed to be derived from a set B uh, by uh, a, the thickness construction, and, and we don't even have B yet, so, so it might feel like I'm a little premature. Uh, except that I'm not, because uh, in this case, the right way to define the set B is to make 
sort of the construction of the set B interact with the thickness construction of A from it. So, so what, what does this mean? Well, this means that I'm going to pretend I have A S and B S already defined, right? Initial parts of their enumerations. Uh, as soon as I have this, uh, I can apply the thickness construction a little bit to get A S plus one, and then uh, to use. Uh, uh, oh, I, I'm doing the other way around. I, I have A S using A S. I'm now going to define what B S plus 1 is and then A S plus 1 is obtained from B S plus 1 using the thickness construction. Notice, so the, the important thing there about the thickness construction is that the thickness construction works level by level. You do not need to have the complete enumeration of B to define the enumeration of A obtained from B by thickness up to step S. That, uh, you can define them lockstep. And now what we're going to do is, is we are going to define them lockstep, but definitely in such a way that then, if after the fact, now you have a complete enumeration of B, if now you do the thickness construction, you really would get the A that you had constructed along the way. Okay. So, what does this mean? I, I'm going to say, uh, assume uh, by induction, I have AS and I have BS plus 1, and now I'm going to say put uh, X, T, E, uh, everything that goes into B will be a triple of this form, uh, exactly which natural number this is, uh, I don't know, there's some coding, this coding corresponds with, with this E being where the E comma of, of B, put this into B S plus 1, if X is in C S, S is greater or equal to T, and uh, X is less than the length of agreement with D uh, for the E computation at stage V for P less than or equal to G less than or equal to S. Um, and, and then using thickness build AS plus 1. And as soon as we have BS plus 1, or as we just defined here in a slightly complicated and curious way, but as soon as we have BS plus 1, we can do the S plus first step of the thickness construction and obtain AS plus 1 from it, and therefore uh, the, 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 the construction keeps going because now I have AS plus 1, and therefore I can define BS plus 1. Right? The, the AS is used over here in the, the, the length of agreement with D. That's the, the AD length of agreement that I'm looking for. So, okay, right, yes, yes, it's computable stuff. So, so, so I, I haven't lost yet, but it seems a little strange. Um, and, uh, uh, and it is a little strange, but it's not without interpretation. What we are trying to do is put information about C into B. Right? We're trying to stick a, a lot of information about C, or all of the information about C into B, and, and then by thickness it would also be found in A. Most of it would be found in A. Um, so, that, that's why this is. If, if something is in C, then we want to put something related into B. Um, but uh, 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 right? uh, just using C for B won't work, so, so, so you need a little more. Uh, what little more do we want? Well, we have these triples, X, T, E, uh, and this triple X, T, E, at time T, this triple becomes eligible to be enumerated into B. Right? Uh, there are some conditions about stuff that happens after time t, 
or f time t and later. So, so this triple is uh, out of consideration until you're at stage t. And, and, and then this triple becomes, let's say, eligible to be enumerated into b. As soon as, as soon as, uh, w whenever this gets enumerated in there, this s is greater or equal to this t. So at this time t, it becomes eligible to be enumerated. What then do you need for it to actually be enumerated? Well, something needs to happen to c. That's because we're trying to get this information about c into b. Um, but uh, but we can't put everything about c into b because b would be too complicated and, and too big. So so so. Uh, when do we allow this information about C to go into B? Well, we allow this if uh, the length of agreement is always greater than this, than this x. Right? What is always? Well, you start looking at this triple at time t, that's when it becomes eligible. Then at time s, when x appears in C, you, you might really enumerate it, but you only do that if between time t and time s, the length of agreement has always been above s. s. And, and, and so this means that at time t, this thing gets, becomes eligible to be enumerated, and it loses this eligibility to be enumerated if the length of agreement drops, drops down too far. Because as soon as it drops down too far, you, you won't get enumerated anymore. As long as it stays up, it, it remains eligible to be enumerated. Yes? It, is it give, it, X is only... It does X eventually lose eligibility? It looks like after time S when it appears in C. Then we look at sort of all the times between when it became eligible and when it appeared. If the length of the room was too low at any of those times, then it's screwed forever, is that...? Yeah, yeah but, but of course, as soon as this is in S, it's also in at CS plus 1. Right. right? It, it, it stays in there. Right, but as we've written the length of the room requirements, we'll look at those previous times even still, so like when... Oh, but, but even the ones where X is not in, in C yet, right? This T right. tells you from, from the time, this, from this T in the triple, up to the time where it appears and you keep looking at it as long as it's eligible, this, this length of agreement needs to be bigger. But if, if you find some point V less than S, where it's, the length of agreement is too low, then we'll keep noticing that as we go along, and so S would, oh, yes. S would never show up in V. It would never show up. As soon as, as, soon as the length shows, right? It, it's sort of the race between these two things. It, we want this length of agreement to be some finite thing, so that you don't succeed in coding a lot about C into V. We want this to be low, but, but, but here we have this race happening between these things. Is it enumerated sufficiently quickly into C? And if it's sufficiently quickly into C, then you stick it in. And sufficiently quickly is exactly determined by this. But of course, part of the argument is showing that these, this really happens. And, and so we're going to assume, well, suppose it doesn't happen, that the length of agreement should jump to infinity, and then you really succeed at doing something. Anyway, that's a lot of abstract nonsense about uh, this, this construction, but this is sort of the, the, the picture you have. At time t, this becomes eligible. It remains eligible until the length of agreement drops too low, and you actually enumerate if x appears in c. That's the, the, the picture here. Uh, and, and so certainly, yes, here we are simultaneously building B and doing the thickness requirement, getting A from it. But now if you have this enumeration of B, then you would get that enumeration of A for the thickness requirement. So, so uh, everything works out uh, just wonderful. The idea of becoming possible to enumerate, D can restrain. Notice that, yes, we are computing a length of agreement, but we're definitely not doing a length of agreement argument. We are, we are, we are using the length of agreement completely differently. Um, and, uh, and we have to. Okay. So now we have completed the construction. We constructed our intermediate B and from it using thickness A. This A should do the job. 
that's, that's the claim now, right? This A works. Okay, what is that? Uh, uh, how do we do that? Well, as usual, by, by joint induction, prove the following four things. The E column of A is almost equal to the E column of B. Right? This is definitely what you would expect to happen in a thickness reconstruction. But, but if, the, if, if the hypothesis of the thickness construction are not satisfied, then, then you might not get this. Um, and um, from A, you cannot construct C. Um, good. So that's one. Two is. Um, From G, we can't compute A, right? These are these requirements QE, requirements QE are satisfied. Um, 3 is uh, B, B, and A, B are computable. And 4 is uh, there exists a C computable function G such that phi uh, C G E is equal to A E. Okay, uh, step one. Let's see that uh, if I prove one through four, now if we prove one through four, uh, we win. <coughs> Uh, A does not compute C, gives us uh, at least that if these things are ordered, the, if these things are ordered the right way, then the order is strict. The last one says exactly that using C as an oracle, I can compute any column of A, but but right this function G is C computable, so computing the eth column is a uniform kind of thing. Therefore, this item four shows that yes. C computes all of A because it uniformly computes all the columns. So these two facts give me that A is strictly below C. Right? All of these together mean A does not compute C. Uh, this one. Right? The, 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 the eth version of 4 say, says that I can define the eth value of g, but then all of these together say that I have the c-computable function g, which allows me to compute the column, so I can compute all of a. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, just from the very start of the construction here, I guess uh, it's not included in these things, just from the very start, the zeroth column of B is all of D. So if I succeed at showing that the eth column of A is almost equal to the eth column of B, then in particular it goes for the zeroth column. And if it goes for the zeroth column, that means that the zeroth column of A computes D, and so uh, D is indeed less than or equal to A. Uh, finally, item 2 altogether show that D does not compute A, so that this is strict. I.e., items 1 through 4 uh, finish over the theorem. I guess you never really said what 3 was before. What did I say about 3 was? I mean, you, you never needed. That's I never needed three, but but but, but I, so so I don't need three for uh, the density theorem. So three is induction overloading. I, I'm going to need three to prove. Uh, I, I need three for small e to prove one for larger e. Everybody happy so far? Okay. One then. 
proof of one. Uh, well, of course, proof of one looks exactly like the thickness lemma. Uh, and uh, because A is constructed using thickness from B and C, you would expect it to follow. Uh, but if you look at the whole thickness lemma, the whole thickness lemma would require you to prove something about um, uh, the first E columns of B not computing C. And we don't have that yet. Uh, so, so what we're going to do instead is do the local thickness lemma. And because what did the local version of the thickness lemma say? Well, if for a given fixed E, not for all E, but for a given fixed E, the first E columns of B do not compute C, then these two things follow for this particular given E. So that's what the, the local thickness says, and, and it was just a matter of observe the proof of all of thickness, and the proof of all of thickness uh, has just the, just the, the hypothesis were used in lockstep with proving the, the conclusions, and therefore you got that. So, so, so what we need to observe is that um, uh, the first E columns of B do not suffice to compute C. That's exactly what we need. They're not, they together are not strong enough to compute C. Uh, but what happens is that this is in fact Turing equivalent to D, which is strictly Turing below C. And so if you're strictly if you're strictly Turing below something, you don't compute that something basically, you know. And this now follows because Column number zero is exactly D, and by the induction hypothesis, the item number three, the the the, the first columns for values less than E, exactly the ones we're using here, uh, have already been shown to be computable, and therefore, if you have if you have D plus finitely many computable sets, uh, you get this Turing equivalence. Not uniformly. No. Uh, this Turing equivalence just says there exists a Turing machine that shows the equivalence, and, and, and we get that from saying, okay, there's, there's D in the first column, and the other ones are computable, therefore there are indices for it. There's only finitely many, so we take these finitely many, we collapse them together. Uh, we haven't proved anything about uniformity. Of course, we don't care about uniformity either. Uh, because uh, the construction was here. This all needed to be uniform. You can't do non-uniform thing from one column to another column. But 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 in the verification, you can do whatever non-uniform stuff you want to. Uh, anyway, so as soon as you observe this, local thickness says now one is satisfied for E. And with everything we've done, one is satisfied for everything less than or equal to E, and the other ones. Are Satisfied for things less than B. Okay. Two then. Uh, the E computation from D does not suffice to compute A. Suffice? It doesn't well, it, I don't know if suffice is the right word. It doesn't compute A, right? Uh, so how is this going to go? Well, I, I, I secretly already talked about it when we wrote on the, the, the uh, construction. Of course, we say, suppose... This happens. Suppose that these two things uh, are equal. But I'll if they are equal, then the length of agreement goes off to infinity. Right? The limit over S of the length, the D length of agreement is infinity. How effectively is it infinity? 
another length of agreement arguments. We had to deal with true stages and things to, to get a handle on, on, on how this was going to infinity. Uh, as a third, uh, for every n, there is an s such as from that point on you're strictly above s. But, but where does this happen? Well, uh, not computably so necessarily, but it doesn't have to be computably so. Uh, it does happen decomputably so. It's the next observation. Okay, first, notice that D is C. Therefore, well, our C E sets are our, our, our close friends, right? they are the, the well behaved ones. But in particular, uh, the modulus is decomputable. Remember, the, the, the modulus function is that function that says, well, uh, the modulus of x says, uh, gives you a time t, such that from time t onward, the initial segment up to and including x has reached its permanent state. So, uh, and, and if you have an arbitrary delta 2 set, then, then you can still not use this delta 2 set to compute the modulus because you, you go and you look for a time when does this initial segment look to have stabilized but then the, 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 a delta 2 set can then at a later time take something out and stick it back in or stick something in and take it back out but if it's a CE set, the first time that this initial segment looks like D is the modulus so, so, so you, you have a decomputable way to figure out when D has completely stabilized. Why does this help? Well, this helps because now you look at this length of agreement and, and, and you know, okay, I, I know when certain parts, I can decomputably decide when certain parts of D have stabilized. And, and so when a certain part of D has stabilized and is involved with this length of agreement, then that length of agreement has reached its final value. A is also C. It can. It also can jump back and forth. So this shows that uh, you still might not be able to tell that what, what the least value is where this thing stays above a certain value. But at least you can find a time from which you can certify that from this point on it will stay above this value. Uh, why do we care? Why do we care? Uh, because this says now. Uh, for a given x, we can indeed computably find a time of tx uh, such that x is less than the d length of agreement um, for all s greater than tx. Right? This this happens if you look at the initial part up to and including x of this length of agreement uh, calculation and all the d use of these calculations is part of the part of d that has already stabilized then forever this length of agreement will it might still go up and down but it can go down to less than or equal to x uh, right? and decomputable and not computable but it's good enough So, so what does this mean? If this length of agreement is permanently above this x, then this phenomenon, which I just erased as far as this chalk is allowing me to erase it, but, but this length of agreement will never drop down below x. So this means that if you have a triple x t e, uh, if it is eligible to be enumerated at time tx, it will forever be eligible to be enumerated. And that means, uh, I should write something, okay. it says x tx 
heat is permanently eligible to be enumerated. But what does it mean if you're permanently eligible to be enumerated? Well, that means exactly that x is in t if and only if x t x e is in e. e. Right? If you're permanently eligible to be enumerated, then you are enumerated if ever x appears in c. And you are not enumerated if x never appears in c. So for a permanently eligible triple, you get this equivalence for, for this particular time tx, which was decomputable. Um, so what does this show? This shows right, that uh, c is uh, pure computable from the eth column of b. Okay, and, and, and now we just collect other facts we already know together. And, and uh, it's okay. We know that A is pure and computable from B, because well, that's, that's our assumption in this, this whole part of the proof, right? That the, the E computation, in, in fact, does this computation. But if this happens, then uh, the E column of A is computable from D. We, we prove one first because now we know that the e column of A is almost equal to the e column of B. So this means that uh, uh, the e column of B is Turing computable uh, from D. Uh, and that means that now is less than or equal to B, E is less than or equal to D, which is a, a contradiction. Uh, although I, I, I did realize uh, I lied to you a little bit. in a way that can be corrected, but, but it, it certainly is not correct. Gracias.
Can you not compute if you find your TX? Exactly. It's decomputable. Yeah. Right? So, so, so from X to TX is decomputable. So, so yes, this equivalence is, is certainly true, but given X, you cannot computably find this triple. You can decomputably find this triple. So, so this equivalence is quite good enough. Well, actually, it is good enough. Because right, in the end, all we want is that C is reducible to D as a contradiction. So, add in D. Now you can compute from X to the triple using D. Here you add in D. So one is the sum of two things computable, if both of the coordinates are, and we proved that B is decomputable, therefore B plus D is decomputable, and you still get exactly the same thing. But, but, uh, right? this equivalence is not a computable equivalence, it's a decomputable equivalence. Yeah, that's of course a silly way of saying it, but 